On the 8th of August 2012, hundreds of civilians gathered in Tripoli's Martyr Square. They were holding candles, a symbol of reconciliation, and chanting to remember the thousands of Libyans who had died during the civil war to remove Muammar Gaddafi from power. They were celebrating the first peaceful transition of power in modern history in their country. After the National Transitional Council, the body, which represented all the rebel forces in the civil war, gave power to the democratically elected General National Congress. Little did they know that, just one year and a half later, the country would plunge into another civil war. That still goes on today. Hello, I'm your host Pietro, and this is the Libyan Civil War. <laughs> وعلى الشعب التركي الصديق الذي تربطنا به أواصر الأخوة في الإسلام Part 1. A brief overview of the civil war from 2014 to today. In January 2014, the General National Congress, having failed to reform the constitution in the two-year period that it set for itself, is forced to call for new elections. The new elections is a very low turnout of only 18% and the Islamist parties that dominated the Congress up until that point boycott the election and uh, get defeated by opposition parties. The Islamist militias, linked to the parties that got defeated in the election, initially accepted the results, but after disagreements regarding the constitutional roadmap, occupied the capital city of Tripoli and rejected the authority of the House of Representatives establishing a parallel congress in Tripoli. The newly elected House of Representatives split himself immediately. The members of the Islamist parties that got defeated in the election joined the General National Congress in Tripoli, while the parties that won the election established a parallel House of Representatives in Tobruk, which initially was internationally recognized. In 2014, War breaks out again in Libya, between the General National Congress and the House of Representatives. The war goes on for two years, and in the beginning of 2016, the Libyan political agreement is signed under the watch of the international community. The General National Congress is dissolved and replaced by the Government of National Accord, which is backed by the UN and is a compromise between the Haftar forces and the GNC. Although, the situation on the ground is far from being resolved. ISIS controls a large portion of the coast of Libya, including the city of Sirte. Tribal militias control a large part of the south of the country, especially the Tuareg militia and the Tabu militia. The Benghazi Mujahideen Council is an independent entity in the city of Benghazi, which for the moment rejects the authority both of the GNA and the LNA. The House of Representatives in Tobruk, despite previously endorsing it, retires its support for the Government of National Accord and becomes its rival in the control of the country. At this point, with the House of Representatives and the Government of National Accord going into open war, the situation on the ground is the following. The Government of National Accord is mostly supported by militias from the coastal city of Misurata, and the House of Representatives is supported by the Libyan National Army, whose chief of staff is Field Marshal Khalifa Haftar. By October 2016, ISIS is almost completely defeated in a joint offensive by both the GNA and the LNA, with the city of Sirte, the most important city held by the Islamic State, now under LNA control. 
In October 2016, there is an attempt of a coup against the GNA in Tripoli by disgruntled remnants of the GNC, the General National Council, which is angry that the government of national accord gave too much concessions to Khalifa Haftar. The coup is eventually defeated and the GNC gets absorbed by the GNA. Since 2016, the LNA has made major advances in Libya and now controls almost 90% of the territory of the country. However, even though the GNA controls like 10% of the country, it still controls a large part of the population, which is concentrated in the capital city of Tripoli and in the big city of Misurata. Today, in March 2020, despite many conferences, despite many attempts to resolve the situation diplomatically, the conflict is producing more casualties than ever, and there is no near end in sight. Part 2 the military alliances of the two factions. We're going to start with the GNA. The GNA, despite controlling the most important city of Libya and its capital, Tripoli, is actually mostly backed by the city of Misurata, where most of the military and economic support comes from. The city of Misurata is a particular city in Libya, even because of its ethnicity background. The Misratans are not ethnically Arabs, but they are considered to be of Turkish ethnicity. They have strong ties to Turkey and Italy. The relationship of the city of Misrata with the GNA is not always stable. There is friction at times, especially today. But, until now, the Misratan militias have been instrumental in guaranteeing the survival of the GNA, and will continue to do so in the near future. Another important backer of the GNA is Turkey. Turkey has seen its involvement in the conflict growing more in the recent days. Frequent drone strikes have been reported on the front lines of the civil war and they are causing massive casualties in the LNA, even to its leadership, with precise drone strikes targeting both the command centers of the LNA and the supply convoys going from the east to the west of the country. Turkish involvement is going to be a major factor in the civil war going forward. Yesterday, Turkey has even used its naval assets against the LNA air superiority. A few hundred of the Turkish armed forces personnel is stationed in Tripoli, but that is only the official number. Two Turkish secret service agents were killed on an artillery strike in the port of Tripoli. And there were reports of Turkish militants fighting even in the front lines of the civil war, although they are not entirely confirmed. And it is not clear if they were there under the orders of the Turkish government or simply as volunteers. Turkey is also the major supplier of arms to the GNA. The supply almost entirely comes from the sea. Another backer of the GNA is Qatar, which provides mostly financial backing because of its close relationship with Turkey and because of its antagonism with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, which we will see are major backers of the LNA. This brings us to the last major backer of the GNA, which is Italy. A few hundred troops of the Italian armed forces are stationed in Misurata. Officially, they're there for training the GNA, providing medical assistance and helping in reconnaissance. But perhaps the most important intervention of Italy in the Libyan civil war is regarding the Libyan Navy. Italy is the most important supplier and trainer of the Libyan Navy of the Government of National Accord. They supplied many ships and aid the Navy in its operation. Domestically, this has been justified for curbing illegal immigration, which mostly stems from human trafficking from the coast of Libya controlled by the GNA. There has been a controversial agreement between Italy and the militias that back the GNA to stop illegal immigration stemming from the country. Italy has provided financing to the militias in return for them stopping human trafficking from the country. The extent of this collaboration is not clear and it's a subject of a trial in Italy. 
Now let's talk about the LNA. The Libyan National Army is mostly formed by old officials of the Gaddafi Armed Forces. Marshal Khalifa Haftar was part of them before joining the rebellion against the colonel. Another part of the Libyan National Army is formed by tribal allegiances. These tribal allegiances with the Tabu and Tuareg tribes, however, were not always stable. Today, the Tabu militia, which operates in the south of Libya in the desert of the Sahara, which previously backed the Libyan National Army, is in open conflict with them. The Libyan National Army is also backed by Salafist militias, which are linked to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which provides political and financial support. Perhaps, though, the most important backer to this day has been the United Arab Emirates. Most of the arms for the Libyan National Army come from the UAE. The Emirates also provide air support with drone strikes. There has also been reports of them recruiting East African mercenaries to fight in the conflict. The second most important backer of the LNA is Egypt. Emirati planes carrying supplies for the LNA almost always land in Egypt, from which the supplies are transported via the most secure land border through Egypt. There has even been talk of a direct military intervention by the Al-Sisi regime in the face of a growing threat from Turkey. The last important backer of the LNA which I want to talk about is France. France was very important in the destitution of Muammar Gaddafi, starting the NATO mission and the no-fly zone. Since then, the country has been greatly involved in Libyan affairs. However, instead of backing the government of national accord which is recognized by the UN, France backed the forces of Khalifa Haftar and the House of Representatives, going against the consensus of most of its European allies and engaging in a geopolitical competition with Italy over the oil reserves of the country. There have been reports of even French special forces participating in the conflict, but they seem to have stopped and now France offers only political support to the LNA. Although I think the French involvement in the conflict will ramp up in the following days and months, but perhaps we will talk about it more extensively in the next episodes. Part 3. The situation now. The first thing that comes to mind is what impact is COVID-19 having on the conflict. Sadly, its impact has been minimal. Fighting has not only continued, but basically increased in the last weeks. And there is no intention to stop on both parts. COVID-19 is only going to make the situation worse for the Libyan civilians. The front lines are mostly stable, but there have been casualties and offensive on both sides. I don't want to talk about it in this episode, because we will have many episodes in the future to talk about the situation on the ground in more detail. And for now, I'm going to leave it at that. So, going forward with this podcast, I want, basically, to update you every week or every second week about the precise developments on the ground in Libya and also every news that is important for the future of the civil war, like uh, international initiatives, diplomatic backing and uh, new military interventions. I'm going to use both primary and secondary sources. Also, with the time I have left after I describe the situation on the ground, I want to delve into a specific topic which I will choose every time differently. In a sense, this has been an atypical episode because I wanted to provide a bit of background on the conflict for those that don't know anything about it. But in the future, this is going to be completely different and I'm going to provide not an historical analysis, but a contemporary one. As you can probably tell, I'm not very experienced in making podcasts, and every feedback is greatly appreciated. So, if you listen to this episode and want to tell me something to improve it, feel free to contact me through my Twitter or through my website at lcw.budzesprout.com. I hope you enjoyed listening to me, and see you next time.